Well, my charge was uh, to talk about early modern legal history. Now, what are the themes that could be discussed under the heading of early modern legal history? Uh, the potential list is quite long. Um, if you look at a survey course or a textbook, there's a common uh, group of themes that keeps emerging. Uh, the development of the European jus commune, that fusion of Roman law as glossed and commented upon, plus canon law, plus selected uh, feudal and customary laws. Another uh, subject would be the, the so-called reception of the jus commune, or legal humanism, the drive towards method and systemization, the impact of the Reformation, natural law theory, codification, the impact of printing, the peculiarities of the English case. To treat these themes adequately would take far more than a lecture, particularly if one expanded legal history to take in early modern constitutional history. So rather than try to treat a whole bunch of things quickly, I'm going to pick out two clusters of subjects and go into them at some depth. First, I want to talk at some length about one of the themes of the conference identified by the organizers, namely print and its role in the popularization of law. And I'm going to be a little contrarian and focus on the resistance to and the concerns about vigorous legal dissemination. Second, I want to venture some suggestions about how early modern Jewish history might enrich or challenge the assumptions of scholars who work on early modern general European legal history. A number of these suggestions involve ways of thinking about legal pluralism, which was another of the themes identified by the conference organizers. So let's start with uh, print and its role in the popularization of law. By the late 18th century, it had become a commonplace in most areas of Europe that not only government officials and lawyers, but politically aware and politically responsible subjects should have access to the inner reasoning of the laws under which they lived. That is, they should have access not only to the surface layer of commands, but to the deeper levels of the law, its disputes, its sprawling intellectual resources, its method of interpretation. Access to the inner reasoning of the law, then, should be a right, not a privilege doled out by rulers. These sentiments, which have descended from the 18th century to today, have become revered commonplaces. But they were hardly commonplaces 200 years before that in the 16th century. They presuppose a relationship between the public and its own law which was alien to the 16th century, or at least nascent. The transmission of law to the public in the 16th century predominantly aimed at teaching obligations and boundaries, directing law enforcement efforts, and guiding conscience. It, this, this teaching positioned the subject as the judged, the bounded, and the taught. The ideal that appeared so often in the late 18th century of widespread and vigorous legal dissemination to a legally literate public was, back in the 16th century, fraught with uncertainty, open to experiment, and often denied as a positive good. Scholarship on the use of printing and the popularization of law offers a way into this complicated history. At first glance, reservations about legal dissemination can be obscured by the growth of law printing in the 16th century and its explosion in the 17th century. The marked expansion and diversification of law printing is really the better known story. So I'm just going to mention that briefly before I move on to doubts and problems. Um, in England, France, and Germany, similar pressures drove the market for law books. Uh, in all three countries, we see a significant increase in the number of law students and legal practitioners. We see the re increasing recruitment of jurists into royal and seigneurial offices. Third, we see re increasing recruitment of lay people into commissions and tribunals of royal and seigneurial government in a process some have called incipient bureauc bureaucratization. These laymen needed an overview of the law and primers on their duties, so they went to buy law books. And they were joined by readers drawn from the middling sort, made newly curious by literacy and newly curious by the experience of textual analysis and disputation in the religious sphere. Fourth, we see the increasing presence of learned law, that is, canon law, civil law, English common law, in seigneurial, local, and urban courts, a slow process of infiltration that has been called reception. 
learned law sometimes displaced custom, but more typically became the vehicle for interpreting and constraining custom. And fifth, we see the heightened presence of law as a lingua franca of politics. Law had always been, of course, a key element of politics, along with patronage, kinship, theological argument, and so forth. But law's relative position in this mix becomes more prominent in the early modern period. And sophisticated appeals to law arose from confessional disputes and conflict over uh, state building. So all of these different factors were playing upon and pushing the market for law publishing on both the supply side and the demand side. And what we see, as is well known, is a shift in law publishing towards the vernacular and a great increase in its extent and variety, particularly after 1600. Um, there are also some charming works that uh, are part of this flood. Uh, in the continent, uh, one could purchase aphorisms or rhyming verse purporting to commit to memory key uh, elements of the institutes. In England, a publisher brought out a verse edition of Cook's reports, which I looked at. Uh, the verse isn't free. <laughs> um, in Friesland in the 1680s, you could find a series of pictorial tiles illustrating uh, various digest titles. So you could put that up on your wall um, and impress your guests. Um, anyway, this vigorous dissemination through books, poems, pictorial titles, um, threatens to mask the resistance and doubt about legal dissemination. Now, we know that, everyone knows that European regimes maintain censorship um, and licensing regimes. And I don't want to go over that history, but focus on a more basic question. To what extent did officials and jurists believe that people had the right to understand the inner reasoning of the law? Elites, of course, agreed that the people should have pounded into their thick skulls their demands, obligations, and maybe the rights and privileges. But should lay people be allowed to go deeper? Should they be allowed to understand the law's interpretive methods, its fictions and disputes, uh, the motivations of jurists, the dissents of jurists? Debates over these questions played out differently in France and England, sorry, France and Germany and in England, and I'm going to treat those countries separately. I'll group France and Germany and start there. So those wishing to reveal the inner reasoning of learned courts in France and Germany could draw on certain elements of the use community and support. They could point out that uh, the appellate tribunal for the Roman Catholic Church, um, which also dealt with secular matters arising in the papal states, uh, has been publishing its reports since the 14th century. It had a norm of dissemination. Uh, the civilian's corpus juris and the many commentaries upon it circulated in widely in manuscript and print. Yet these traditions of revealing laws in a reasoning were in tension with a lingering uh, norm of secrecy in the French parliaments and in the German imperial court. From at least as far back as the 14th century, the Parliament of Paris mandated secrecy in the sense that the judges who issued a decision could not reveal to the litigants or to the public the reasoning behind that decision. Indeed, they couldn't even reveal the, the findings of fact upon which they based their decision. Persons who were not members of the court staff had no access to the records of the court. Occasionally, the, king, the judicial branch of the French King's Privy Council would ask judges on the Parliament of Paris for the reasoning behind their decision. But these documents were treated as state secrets. They were kept under very close guard so that litigants and the public could not get access to them. In the middle 15th century, a number of royal ordinances threatened judges with dismissal from office for violating their oaths of secrecy. Meanwhile, in the German imperial court in the same period, judges were required to, uh, to take an oath that the reasoning behind their decisions would be treated as a mystery. So why the norm of secrecy in the Parliament of Paris? Well, one reason is the Parliament addressed great issues of state as well as normal lawsuits, and the king wanted great issues of state to be kept secret. But also, sometimes the Parliament would uh, depart from strict justice, in the name of equity, and they wanted freedom of action, freedom of decision, which they believed had been delegated to, to them by the king. If their decisions were kept secret, it was harder for people to see them departing from the strict law. 
But this, but, but okay, but if you have a norm of secrecy, how do you square that with the tradition of dissemination in the uh, jus commune? So courts began to distinguish the jus commune from their own practice, the uh, jusus fori. The jus commune grandly presented itself as nothing less than written reason, which implied that all reasonable people should have access to this reason. But the jusus fori was something more modest. It was merely the practice of a particular court. It was what they did and, if they, and what they made, and if they wanted to, they could keep it a secret a mystery. What's striking about the French parliaments and the German imperial court is that they provide an institutional basis for limiting dissemination of the inner reasoning of the law. They're doing more than just complaining or putting up a rearguard action. And as high courts, they provide a model for the legal system and they shape expectations. So during the 16th and early 17th century then in these countries, norms of secrecy and transparency were intertwined in complicated ways. A use commune uh, claiming to be a compilation of reason itself, and therefore by extension something that should be available to all, was supplying the law increasingly for these courts whose use is fori was going to be wrapped in the mantle of secrecy. French norms of secrecy, though, start unraveling in the uh, late 16th and early 17th century, mostly tacitly. What starts happening is that uh, judges who had been keeping notes of decisions for themselves start having their decision, these notes published. Sometimes it is their students who publish them. Sometimes they publish under assumed names. More typically, practitioners in the courts take down reasons that they hear from people through the grapevine, and um, no one is punished for violating the anti-secrecy norm. And bit by bit, we see a tacit breakdown of the secrecy norm. No one's being punished. But given the importance of this breakdown in the secrecy norm, it's really an understudied subject how this happens. But after 1600, we see the great increase in uh, law publishing of, of uh, uh, what are called motivated decisions on the continent. Okay, let's turn now to England. Uh, the English royal courts do not produce a secrecy norm like the French parliaments and the German imperial court. Now this is not to say that people can necessarily get access to the inner reasoning of cases. The judges might not announce their reasoning or they might announce it verbally but no one would remember it. The point here isn't that you could get access to inner reasoning. The point is there was no philosophical commitment to secrecy and no institutional rule mandating secrecy in the late medieval period and the 16th century. So you might assume at this point that England provides a more favorable environment for vigorous legal dissemination. But in fact, there were obstacles and ambiguities. And the pattern or trajectory of legal dissemination was different. In France and Germany, a secrecy norm fades over the late 16th century and becomes ideologically challenged and discredited in the 17th century. England, in England, the trajectory runs the other way, which is to say, in the early to mid 16th century, there seems to be enthusiasm for legal dissemination. Doubt set in in the late 16th and early 17th century. So in other words, if you were to plot it, the, the lines are running in different directions. To understand the causes for concern about legal publication, we must first begin with the case that was articulated in favor of it in the first half of the 16th century. The friends of vigorous legal dissemination, let's call them publicists, were well aware of how vernacular dissemination of scripture and polemical divinity had fueled the Lutheran movement and the German Peasants' War. So the publicists were very careful to portray legal dissemination as a friend to order and kingly power. They said that dissemination of the common law would support the king's law as against the clashing ordinances of the church, localities, the nobility, and so forth. The publicists also echoed the humanist optimistic assessment of the effect of learning on character. Sound knowledge, they said, would be the efficient cause of virtuous action. Such publicist reassurances were more ingenious than sturdy. And by the late 16th century, skepticism about law printing became more incessant and public. 
It wasn't just seditious and erroneous works that were the problem. That was obvious. But even works that would pass muster with the censors and licensors might be a problem. In other words, there was growing unease even with the unexceptional book. To give you a flavor of this stuff, I'm going to quote from the English barrister William Hudson, um, who wrote a treatise on Star Chamber in the early 17th century. And this quote comes from the beginning of his preface. He says, in this prattling age, lawyers rush to publish the reasons of the judgment of the law, the small points and legal fictions to the multitude, who are apt to furnish themselves with shifts to cloak their wickedness, rather than to gain understanding to further the government of the commonwealth. For surely few men would be ruined by dishonest means if men knew not how to cover their dishonesty under, cover, under color of law. Okay, this worry about vigorous legal dissemination occurs in a variety of forms. Uh, Hudson's pretty extreme, so I quoted him for the juicy quote. But you see these worries sometimes as a warning against naive, over-eager publication, sometimes as a tactical maneuver against rivals, and sometimes as an undertone of ambivalence in a, in a program of measured dissemination. So what's wrong with publishing law? I mean, really? It's not publication per se, though that wasn't a fanciful position in early modern Europe. Uh, there were plenty of physicians, mathematicians, chemists, and royal guardians of the secrets of statecraft, unwilling to let their high knowledge come out among the vulgar. There were artisans preserving their trade secrets. There were occultists, alchemists, and hermeticists encanting their mysteries beyond the public eye. But law couldn't remain a secret knowledge of initiates. At least some measure of public promulgation was essential to the legitimacy, to the legitimacy of law and, of course, was essential to its effectiveness. So those who raised cautions about law were not voicing an esotericist program, and nor did they object to the printing of statutes, royal proclamations, local customs, or primers. Their unease focused on the publication of national law if it was done in the wrong style. Now, Hudson's fulminations provide a hint. He worried about publication of the reasons and judgments of the law, the small points and the fictions. Okay? He had this two-tier model of legal knowledge. Lawyers in the state should hammer into the thick-headed multitude the commands of the law, while reserving to the deeper stratum of professional knowledge to lawyers and court officials. Publication of the law's inner reasons unwittingly summoned popular disputation by presenting law as having multiple argumentative possibilities. This distinction between a surface public knowledge and a more profound law uh, reserved for initiates was a common position in learned culture. You could see it among scientists, statesmen, and magicians, no less than lawyers. But maybe even more troubling to these guys than the uh, revelation of the law's inner reasons was the improper psychological framing of printed law. In what style should legal literature speak? Uh, in Plato's immense, immensely influential laws, quoted endlessly by these guys, the Athenian dialogist asks the following, how should we imagine the rightful position of a written law in, its, in society? Should its statutes disclose the lineaments of wise and affectionate parents? Or should they wear the semblance of an autocrat and a despot, issue a menacing order, post it on the walls, and so have done? In support of legal uh, publication, John Milton read this, read Plato, uh, to advocate persuasion as a more winning and more manlike way to keep men in obedience instead of fear. But disdain for this voice of lordly command seemed naive to the skeptics about legal publication, such as the dyspeptic recorder of London, Anthony Benn, friend of William Hudson. Uh, Benn, at the turn of the 17th century, warned us that strategies of, per of strategies of persuasion invite popular contempt. The lawgiver, who gives reasons for his judgment, diminishes his authority. 
This had become a growing problem over the years as law had progressively disarmed in the process of explaining itself. Ben complained that laws of late, quote, must come forth ushered with a luminary oration or preamble as though they had not in themselves and of their own presence a sufficient majesty and grace. The very use of a language of justification was implicitly di dialogic. While seeking persuasion, it invited disputation. To publish the inner reasons of the law threatened a dark future, thought these skeptics. Pennywise customers would go to scriveners and tavern owners and village autodidacts for legal services at the cost of long-term disaster. Champions and skeptics about legal publication agreed that a deep knowledge of law cultivated a reflective, informed order in society. But in practice, argued skeptics, the legal press would only offer a small taste of law to quickly offended gentry, restless aldermen, and uh, nonconformists. Their confused minds would dream of challenging hierarchical superiors and profiting through, litig through litigation. Such talk drew on elite fear of the alienated common people, that is, the many-headed monster, as was termed in England. But the point was deeper. Skeptics about legal publication, who wanted to save the subject from the dangers of craftiness, were trying to force the subject into a pose of unlearned forthrightness, which was morally attractive by some measure, but politically disabling. A reluctance to print law reinforced any hierarchy, um, any hierarchy resting on a pre-existing disparity of access to legal knowledge, including hierarchies at the upper level of the political nation, between court and parliament, between city council and burgesses, between bishop and clergy. Reading the strictures of men like Hudson and Ben only in class terms obscures that what makes them really nervous in the short to medium term. It's not that longshoremen and day laborers will be reading the law, but more people in the political nation will be reading it. Gentry and the middling sort of burgesses, successful yeomen and artisans, clergy, schoolmasters, ship captains. These are the people they're worried about. So the problem then that these skeptics have to face is the following question. Don't English subjects have a right to the inner reasoning of their own law? To turn aside the force of this question, the skeptics needed a vision of what law was and what it was supposed to do. And drawing on high royalist propositions, they reasoned as follows. The king was the fountain of justice, and from him and his predecessors, law flowed. In Aristotelian terms, the king was the soul animating the otherwise inert law and constitution. The king was also the paterfamilias of the realm. This household model of governance emphasized the central educative role of the father king to his subject children, who were forever in their nonage absorbing instruction. And this way of thinking also cast the king as the metaphorical owner of the realm. And as an owner of the realm, he owned the law. Put this all together and we see the following. To ask for access to the inner reasons of a law understood as royal property meant getting access to the inner reaches of the royal mind, an act of unseemly meddling. This was like the student circumventing the educative plan of the teacher king or the father, uh, sorry, or the child demanding more than the father was prepared to tell. The king need not reveal, or more to the point, need not be comfortable with others revealing, a law that by proprietorship and origination was his. For the king, then, disclosure of the reasoning of law was a privilege that he doled out, not a, a right that the subjects had. All right, so publicists needed to confront this cluster of arguments. Um, and they start changing how they talk in England in the late 16th century. Recall that I mentioned in the beginning of the 16th century, the publicists pose as friends of royalism. 
they say, publish the laws, you will increase kingly power. But by the late 16th century, the publicists are running into resistance from these skeptics about law publishing, many of whom are high royalists. So the publicists start changing their tune. Um, they start coming up with counter stories about the origination and fictive ownership of law. First, against the image of the king as a fountain of justice, they emphasize how the common law had evolved out of the customs of English communities, distilled over time. This made the law belong to the people, its originators, not belong to the king. Second, against depictions of the king as the animating soul of the Constitution, publicists followed Cicero in identifying the laws themselves as the soul of the Commonwealth. This suggested that the soul's invigoration of the otherwise inert Commonwealth required dissemination of the law, because how could a hidden law animate the otherwise inert Commonwealth? And third, against royal pretensions to own the law, publicists started talking about the law as the birthright or inheritance of Englishmen. That's where that talk comes from, the law is our inheritance. You start seeing it around 1600, plus or minus 20 years. So the publicists pushed these arguments in their contests with high royalists, and what they started doing was helping to redefine the common law in the realm of perception, redefining it away from a courtly and guild knowledge and towards a national knowledge. The publicists then were reimagining the people's relationship to its own law, and they were answering these pressing questions. In what sense and to what purpose was the law to be common? And now that we're having an effective national law, whose law was this national law to be? Overall, then, uh, the publicists were helping to refashion the laws of the realm of England into the laws of Englishmen. Okay, so the English story is different than the continental story. Um, I've spoken more about England than the continent, because I know more about England, and I'm sure that other people could speak a lot more about the continent. So what does this stuff have to do uh, with um, the early modern Jewish world? At first glance, some similarities appear. Um, Jewish communities and regional synods exercised control over the publication of books, and some required pre-publication approval, as did European licensing systems. At least some Ashkenazic rabbis expressed concern over the dangers of printing Jewish legal texts and of introducing print into the mixed oral manuscript world of Torah and Talmud study. Um, there's a wonderful article I read by um, Elchanan Reiner. Is he here? Sitting here? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, who's, uh, I'll just summarize it in three sentences. Um, but he published a, a study of the apprehensions about printing voiced by Rabbi uh, Chaim of Friedberg in the middle 16th century. Um, Rabbi Chaim worried that printing would freeze halacha and make it rigid, robbing it of the fluidity that it enjoyed in a mixed manuscript oral world where there was continual glossing and commentary. Uh, printing also tacitly claimed authority for a text, but a text should be no more, thought Rabbi Chaim, than an aid to the memory of the scholar. Authority really inhered in the community of well-trained scholars, their oral manuscript world. A text shouldn't arrogate this authority. And printing also threatened the near monopoly that the rabbinic um, elites had on the transmission of halachic knowledge under controlled conditions. What's very interesting is you can find the same points made in almost the same language among English barristers at the same point in time. These barristers did not know Rabbi Chaim, and I assume vice versa, but it is almost freakish the extent to which they are saying the same thing, which is also sort of, for comparative history, an interesting control on religion as a variable. I'll just mention that parenthetically. Um, so, um, but the English barrister said some other things uh, as well about print uh, and why they're worried about it that uh, Rabbi Chaim didn't say, at least as uh, El Hanan Reiner summarizes him. So let me voice some of these other apprehensions that the English barristers were saying, and I wonder if they have resonance in the Ashkenazic world. I'll leave it this, to the audience to, to figure that out. 
First of all, English jurists worried about the uh, tacit lawmaking power of printers. Now, there are a whole lot of legal texts that could gain the uh, uh, approval of licensors, but then it was up to the printers to select which of them to bring out, and the printers could also redact the texts and mix one with another. And they could add introductions and textual apparatus that pushed certain inter interpretations and submerged others. Sometimes, um, the printers simply left out statutes that they didn't want people to know about. Well, since all power requires legitimation, where's the legitimation for this tacit lawmaking power? One royalist commentator accused law printers of subtly producing a new invented government. Okay. Second anxiety of English barristers, they worried about what I'll term the lethality of publishing. Print redistributes law between a published foreground and a manuscript and oral background. This lends weight to certain types of texts and arguments and not others. So the power of printers to push certain arguments into the light of printing um, implicitly cast other texts and arguments back further into the shadows. Early modern lawyers knew that printed books could quell debate and suggest a settled uniformity of opinion killing off inquiry as readily as provoking it. The lawyer and courtier, uh, courtier Francis Bacon, saw an opportunity here. Um, Bacon called for the English crown to oversee law reporting and law publishing in order to leave out unpalatable texts and interpretations, such as Cook was putting forth. And Bacon also suggested that only printed texts should be citable in courts. Now this was lethality. All right, you can only cite what is printed and the crown would oversee the printing. Okay. I, I love quoting Francis Bacon and in the early modern intellectual culture all ideas and people are within six degrees of separation of Francis Bacon. Third, many areas of uh, early modern Europe experience competition between customary law and a variety of so-called written laws. And written laws would include statutes, royal edicts, scripture, canon law, civil law. Law printing could be sucked into these legitimation struggles. English common lawyers uh, classified their common law as an unwritten law, born of custom, rather than a written law, like the civil law, scripture, etc. So long as the common law remained largely unpublished, its practitioners could more easily call it an unwritten law. You know, it's hard to say a law is unwritten if it's published and sitting in front of you, but so long as it's unpublished, it's easier to say it's unwritten. And that brought certain forensic advantages when common lawyers competed for jurisdiction and dignity with their civilian and ecclesiastical rivals. Common lawyers like to say that the very unwrittenness of their common law suggested a family resemblance between the common law and the unwritten natural law that emanation from God's mind that had such honor in their culture. Also, the unwritten common law bore comparison with Lycurgus's unwritten Spartan ordinances, famous for their terseness and resistance to degeneration over time, so different from the Athenians' written ordinances, which were mutable and easily broken. This comparison not only awarded the common law of an honorable classical pedigree, it also focused attention on how Englishmen, like the Spartans of old, needed to impress into their memories an unwritten law. In so doing, they would take the law into their spirits, and in interiorizing it, they would train their character in the virtue and obedience that law supposedly taught. This was a legitimation story, and it depended on unwrittenness and therefore resisted printing. So this is sort of the third type of anxiety that the common lawyers had, and I just leave for the audience whether these anxieties are showing up in the Ashkenazic world. Okay. Um, enough then on um, uh, popularization of law. Let me turn to the second major thing I'd like to talk about, which is how the Jewish experience might lead um, early modern legal historians to revise some of their thinking. Um, I write on, as, as uh, Professor Kaplan said, I write on uh, early America, early modern England. I don't work on Jewish history, 
And when I told this to Professor Kaplan, she said that the keynote speaker is not supposed to be an expert on Jewish history. This is quite by design. Um, I should talk about early modern history generally and connect where possible to things Jewish, but the rub, of course, is uh, how do you connect to things Jewish? Uh, so to meet this challenge, um, I thought of the story of the Passover Seder of the wise, uh, wicked, and simple child asking questions. I'm not going to be the wicked child who says, what matters Jewish history and law to me? Uh, I think Professor Kaplan wanted the wise child, but she got the simple one. Uh, curious, uh, well-intentioned, but naive um, in things Jewish. And I'm only going to hope that maybe despite my naivete, naivete, or maybe because of it, um, I could see something about the relationship of Jewish and general legal history that might be fruitful to insiders in your field. Um, my approach will come from an unexpected direction. Um, I'm not going to suggest ways that concepts drawn from general English and European legal history might enrich Jewish history. Scholars associated with this workshop have already been doing that wonderfully, uh, recently bringing to bear on Jewish history literatures on, for instance, comparative state building and confessionalization. Um, instead, I'm going to muse about how the Jewish experience might be intriguing for English and European legal historians who aren't Jewish historians. Um, you might distinguish between an import and an export model. The import model is bringing things from early modern legal history into Jewish history. The export model would be exporting from Jewish history outwards, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. Okay, I've got four suggestions. So here's the first one. It's about the intersection of legal pluralism and religious pluralism. So Jews in early modern Europe typically brought their disputes to courts run by Jewish uh, laymen or rabbis. But to varying degrees in different places, they had the right to sue in non-Jewish courts, that is, to courts overseen by Christian authorities. Jewish authorities feared the threat to the Jewish community posed by Jews invoking the jurisdiction of Christian courts. Jewish authorities tried to regulate those who might approach Christian courts. They strongly condemned individuals suing in these courts without permission, but the Kahila could not prevent the practice. <coughs> well, this kind of situation, where a community tries to prevent its members from appealing to higher authorities outside the community, is very familiar from early modern law. But what's the right analogy to the Jewish case? Well, let me distinguish a couple. Here's the first analogy. There were, all throughout Europe, there were partially, partially self-governing communities hoping to maximize their degree of autonomy in the face of national authorities pursuing state building. Examples would include English chartered boroughs trying to keep decision making and uh, uh, dispute resolution within the borough and being very displeased with appeals to justices of the peace or royal courts. You can see this among chartered guilds hoping to prevent their members from seeking out urban courts. You see it in New World colonies. Um, early Massachusetts forbid appeals to England and imprison people who tried to do it. Now, state building was in part pursued by jurisdictional transfers from lower courts, which might be those of guilds, towns, petty seigneurial courts, village courts, transfers from lower courts to higher courts, courts of the emperor, the prince, the king, nobles. These jurisdictional transfers could take many forms, attempts to force cases into higher courts, uh, or uh, permission to allow removal of cases from lower to higher courts at the option of the litigants, or the provision of incentives to attract courts to the higher, to attract cases to higher courts. Um, so one model then for thinking about the Jewish situation then is the semi-autonomous um, community trying to escape from the pressures of uh, state building and higher authorities. But the Jewish communities were not just jurisdictions in a world of legal pluralism and state building. They were that, but they were also religious communities hoping to maintain particular religious beliefs and behaviors in the face of skeptical or hostile higher authorities. Looked at from this perspective, there may be a rough analogy between what's going on in these Jewish communities 
and what's going on among English separatists, Puritans, and the early Quaker communities. These groups very much try to prevent their adherents from going to outside jurisdictions. Religious authorities wanted to prevent the outside community from exploiting fissures within the religious group. They didn't want outside tribunals to challenge power hierarchies within their community. They worried about the pollution, so to speak, that these other sources of law would introduce among them. Students of these kinds of Christian religious communities who look at their dispute resolution uh, mechanisms and their strategies for opting out of state jurisdictions, so these students seldom look at the Jewish case. To the early modern English and European legal historian, the Jewish experience could be read alongside the experience of Christian sects and minorities to get more insight into the complicated relationship between religious pluralism and legal pluralism. How much of the experience of Jewish communities and Christian sects trying to prevent disputes from getting to state courts was jurisdictional and how much was theological. That is, how much of their experience was driven by the structural relationship of semi-autonomous groups to state law in the context of intense legal pluralism? And how much of the experience was driven by theological differences between the minority religious communities and the state's elites? By looking simultaneously at the history of Christian sects and Jewish communities, a historian could better disentangle theological factors from jurisdictional or structural factors. Okay. Second thing I want to talk about, Protestant Biblicism. Uh, the early modern period was the great age of Protestant legal Biblicism. Uh, jurists and ministers tried to establish which parts of the judicial law of Moses were still binding upon Christians. Um, the Christian um, uh, Protest the Protestant Biblicists distinguished between the so-called ceremonial, moral, and judicial laws of Moses. The moral laws were eternally binding. The ceremonial laws had been abrogated by the coming of Christ. The judicial law might or might not be binding upon current day Christians. It depended on a number of factors. Specifically, did the judicial laws of Moses partake of some measure of the moral law? How do you know this? You look to see whether the judicial laws of Moses are still being used by civilized peoples about the, the world. But you also ask, were these judicial laws proper only to the situation of the Jews in Israel in biblical times? If so, the law was not of continuing validity. Well, for very different reasons, Jewish rabbis were curious about which portions of Jewish law were specific to Eretz Yisrael and did not transfer into the diaspora, and which, of course, did transfer. To my knowledge, early modern Jews and Protestants pursued separately their respective analyses of which laws of Moses were confined to the Holy Land and which laws had continuing validity. At least, the early modern Protestant sources that I read don't talk about the inquiries of their Jewish contemporaries. Okay? They would talk about Jewish sources from 2,000 years ago, but they wouldn't talk about what rabbis in Poland in 1600 were thinking about these subjects. Modern, Protest excuse me, modern scholarship on Protestant Biblicism doesn't refer to early modern Jewish inquiries, or for that matter, to scholarship on the problem by present-day Jewish historians. It seems to me it would be very helpful to bring these things together, to run a comparison or an interaction between Jewish scholarship on early modern Jews thinking about the continuing validity of Mosaic law and early modern Protestants undergoing the same inquiries. Third suggestion about learned versus non-learned traditions. One of the big issues in um, early uh, modern legal history is the so-called reception issue, which is how learned law, the use commune, or in England the common law, um, increasingly gains a presence in courts and starts to control or supplant customary law and edicts. Jewish law, halakha, is of course a learned law tradition. It has its key texts, Torah, Talmud. It has its glosses and commentaries, its codifications, its highly trained interpreters, its schools for training new interpreters. 
And of course, Jewish learned law, halakha, had to deal with other forms of law, Jewish custom, but it also had to deal with the learned law of Christian communities, the use commune, and the non-learned law of the Christian communities, custom, edicts, and so forth. Well, scholarship on the rise of the English common law and on the reception of the use commune often operates comparatively. The rise of the common law folks look at the reception. The reception of the use communate folks look at the rise of the common law. Yet no one has much to say about the Jewish case. It seems to me that in the Jewish world, we have another situation of a learned law tradition trying to come up with choice of law rules, trying to deal with other learned law traditions and other non-learned law traditions within its community and outside its community seems to me also that the Jewish law tradition might form a third, shall we say, contrast case in addition to the use commune story and the English common law story. Okay, final thing I want to talk about, a final suggestion is uh, what I'll call a diasporic legal communications history. Since I began with legal communications, I want to end there too. Um, one mode of history writing is to write um, the history of communications regimes. This is rather a lot broader than the history of printing. A history of communications regimes would look at intertwined dissemination through print, manuscript, and speech. It would look at the transfer of information through administrative and judicial structures, through trade routes, social networks, popular entertainments, educational and religious institutions, flows of correspondence, and on and on. The point of such a history is to look at the transfer of certain sorts of information, say law, through a society. Now, histories of legal communications have been written for particular territories, nations, regions. They can also be written for colonies connected to a metropolis. This has been done by, for British India. Um, and as uh, Professor Kaplan mentioned, I have an article comparing legal communications regimes in the British and Spanish empires. But the Jewish case presents a uh, different situation. The early modern period was a great age of expulsions from Spain and Western Europe, and then the reforming of communities in East Central and Eastern Europe. Jews didn't have a stable territory, but neither were they forming colonies. A Jewish population leaving Germany and settling in Poland can't be reasonably compared to English or Castilian settlers leaving Europe for the New World. The, dis the difference lies not only in the absence of an intervening ocean and in the smaller distances. Another difference is that unlike the Spanish and English uh, empires, there is no metropolis overseeing the initial migration of Jews and communal rebuilding. And there's no Jewish metropolis there in an ongoing sense overseeing legal development, no metropolis inviting appeals, appointing officials, resolving or igniting disputes, and serving as a cultural and legal focal point. Where the English and Spanish in the Americas um, were the periphery of a metropolitan core, the Jewish communities in Poland were not the periphery of a Jewish core in Germany, quite the contrary as waves of expulsions were driving Jews out of the German cities. So the Jews present a different case, they're a migrating diaspora. And a history of legal communications within a migrating diaspora would be an extremely interesting project to pursue. And it's not just that a migrating diaspora differs from a stable territory or a colony metropole core periphery relationship. It does, but it's not just that. In addition, law was central to the identity of Jewish communities. Jewish communities throughout Europe that differed in forms of self-government and relationships with the non-Jewish world nonetheless all defined themselves as Jews in part through Torah, Talmud, Halakha. For other diaspora communities, Greeks, Armenians, Africans, and the New World, law was not as central a component of communal identity. So this kind of a project, a uh, legal communications history of a migrating diaspora, could be interesting to lots of people, to English and European legal historians, to historians of New World colonization, 
to historians of diasporic communities. Um, and uh, I'm not going to do it, but maybe someone here might like to. So I'll just throw out that suggestion. And thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much, Professor Ross, for what I think is a wonderful beginning to uh, fruitful comparisons and discussions that I hope will take place over the next few days. I think we have some time for some questions or comments. I'm going to sit down and do it from my mic, which is red. But anyone wants to weigh in, please. Um, a wide variety of people. Uh, printers were one of the groups, certainly. In the early to middle 16th century, humanist intellectuals were another key group. Um, the dissemination of scripture, philosophy, classics caught the imagination of the humanists, and they said, why not law? There was a lot of early enthusiasm, and the you know, standard histories of humanism show by the late 16th century, some second thoughts are starting to come in. Uh, we see it in law as well. Uh, law students were another uh, constituency. Um, laymen recruited into royal justice in various forms, uh, justices of the peace, sewer commissioners, things like that. They needed to know what they were doing, so they wanted books. Manuscripts were hard to get and were expensive. Um, politically, uh, certain groups on the outs with the royal court sometimes pushed for dissemination. There was a constitutional wing of Puritanism in the late 16th century that pushed for it. Some of the anti-high anti royalist parliamentarians pushed for it as well uh, in the early 16th century, or early 17th. Uh, I'm thinking just one of your last points about um, the idea of metropolis and a periphery or colonies. And I, I couldn't help but not think of, I have two examples, one in a more concrete way and one's a little more diffuse, and I'm curious for people who know much more about the, the legality and the, and, the, and the social structures of, the, of these two examples could, could elucidate or show me that I'm completely wrong. But one is, is um, the Western Sparta community based in Amsterdam as being a real center where other Spanish-Portuguese communities in Western Europe um, and, and in the New World were constantly sending questions, we're asking for rabbis, we're asking for authorities, um, and those were social links, communal links, um, economic links were, were the, main, the main drive there. Um, and that served, that served as, that, and that crossed, you know, it, we have this in the British colonies, we have this in Dutch colonies, um, and so you see it in different, different ways. And another way of thinking about it in a much more diffuse way, a more um, spiritual or religious way, is Kabbalah in some level. Could we think of Kabbalah emanating from Tzfat in the 16th century, connecting cross-nationally um, with all sorts of communities that are looking for, qu qu have questions, many of which are legal, which are they're looking for the true um, answer, and they go back to center, cent certain centers being you know, spread throughout. Um, and yeah, so those are just some examples that uh, the two examples that came to mind as possible, interesting models to think about, and there could be many others in other, in other fields. That, yeah, yeah. The, the Amsterdam example, I, I take that to heart. It's a very good example. The qualification I'd introduce is um, Amsterdam serves as a core for a particular set of peripheries rather than the whole Jewish world, right? My understanding is that Jews in Poland or Italy would not necessarily be looking to Amsterdam. No, so, it's, it's, right. It's, right. It's, it's its own, it's its own right. wing, its own community, however you want to call it. But it's, um, right. So, Amsterdam so, started out looking to the Venice. Right. So maybe the way, uh, the way to put it, my, uh, let me um, rephrase it. There would be a series of perhaps local or partial 
core periphery relationships within the Jewish world. But there's nothing like what London is to the British colonies or Castile is to Spanish America, right? There's, so so I, I guess that would be the differentiation. Um, as for uh, Tzfat, um, I, I would also maybe want to distinguish the center of, of the production of important texts, in, whether in Kabbalah, the Shulchan Aruch, whatever you're looking at, from in, in the metropole in a colonial sense, which is not just a textual production center, it's an administrative center. It takes judicial appeals. It has military forces. Uh, it provides money. It fires people, you know, and on and on. So I, I would say that the metropole, as I'm using it, I think would differ from your notion of, a, say, a textual core. Um, it seems to me that you are speaking throughout your talk mainly with the late 16th and the beginning of the 17th century only, right? So I think I just want to put out a general question. What happens to this story towards the end of the 17th century? Yeah. Um, on, in, I know more about the English case than the, uh, the continental case. Um, the English case is tricky because you then get the English re Revolution, which is a huge flourishing of all sorts of uh, legal dissemination schemes. The Restoration sees a variety of forms of attempted reaction by the royal court, um, which are only partially successful. And after the Glorious Revolution, uh, and you move into the early 18th century, um, the skepticism about law publishing is largely discredited. You cannot anymore say with a straight face, if you're a royal courtier or a barrister, that the inner reasoning of law is the guild mystery of the lawyers or the king's pr property or the emanation of his mind. I mean, this way of talking uh, would get you laughed at in 1710 but it's still alive in the restoration period if subordinate. Um, unfortunately, I don't know enough about the continental case to track the story more, but the things I've read suggest that the big story is the dissolution of institutionally based secrecy norms, and that is occurring late 16th through 17th century, but others more knowledgeable about this would have to fill in more. Um, I'd like to ask with someone who works on law on the question of comparison of different types of law. Can halakha be usefully compared with the kind of English law that you're speaking about? Are they, is that one type of law? Or are we talking about two different types of law? And if so, how does the comparison work? Um, the suggestion I made for thinking about halakha, common law, and use community as different forms of learned law would have, if it were done, would have to be done at a high level of generalization. Because, um, for instance, if you compare common law to use community, you can distinguish them on all sorts of bases. Yet, it's a commonplace in general legal history to try to think of them in parallel as learned law traditions ascending to a higher relative position in their respective uh, countries. I think you could do the same, I, I think it would be interesting, I'm not a Jewish law well, expert, obviously, I, but I think it would be interesting to say, what happens if you put the hal halakha struggle with other learned law and non-law learned law traditions into this mix? Do you, for instance, see the same sorts of maneuvers, moves, choice of law principles evolving in halakhic law that you would see in use commune in English common law. You may have cases of parallel discovery or cases of uh, influence uh, or of influence. You, you may, for instance, find that a certain repertoire of moves seems to develop in vastly different political and religious contexts, which might tell you something interesting about the impact of religion as a variable on legal reasoning. Okay. Now, these are just some things that uh, spring to my mind, but in no sense would I underestimate the difference between halakha and these other traditions. Yeah, um, I have uh, two sort of, um, I don't know if they're, they're questions or, or, or um, suggestions or hopes that you would want to go further. The, the first has to do with this notion of uh, uh, local jurisdictions fighting centralized 
uh, 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 groups, the, the state coming in, so that, that what happens in uh, in Jewish law may, or what, what happens in the independence of uh, Jewish court systems may in fact be parallel with, with a, a plura, plurality of jurisdictions issue. But um, uh, in fact, I think, um, uh, not, not to deny that, I, I think that's, that's a, a, a very correct way to approach uh, these issues. But, but th there might be a subset to that, which is a case where uh, Jews didn't just uh, object to uh, taking court uh, cases to the outside. Obviously, some elements within Jewish communities did. But they also interacted with local court systems, which were fighting centralization, specifically with regard to the Jews. In other words, uh, as an example, uh, uh, Jews in, in Bologna are essentially living under the protection of the local authorities. But when the papal state takes over Bologna, and controls things directly, um, there's a, a, a stage at which Bolognese uh, officials try to protect uh, the rights of Jews. And then at a certain point, the Jews are removed from their jurisdiction or their uh, kind of chartering uh, powers and moved over to the papal system. And they're basically eliminated from, from the discussion. So to some extent, in other words, the uh, argument you're looking at as a model also has practical implications in the, in the way it, it articulates itself. Anyway, I, I don't know if you, you want to go further with that, but let me throw out one other thing while we're at it. Um, I, I have the, the great good uh, luck to have a daughter who's a lawyer. And my, I just wanted to mention that in case I hadn't mentioned it already. <laughs> but my daughter's a lawyer. Uh, one of the great revelations for her when she was in law school and interning and uh, which she shared with me was that the practice of law in the courts in California, obviously it's not going to be like that anywhere else, but only in California, in fact very often has very little to do with the law. That, that what actually happens in the court, very often the lawyers are trying to teach the judge what the law is and whether the judge actually listens to them or not, whether precedent really plays any role, is, is very often up in the air. It depends on what, you know, all kinds of very immediate personal things. Now, it, 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 struck, it struck me that your conversation, your, your, your talk, which, which I enjoyed enormously, and, and, and much of our talk about halakha takes as an assumption the kind of coherence of legal theory, of legal justice, of legal precedent, and so forth and so on, uh, whether it's common law or whether it's uh, uh, statutory law or, or, or tenant law, etc., etc. But my daughter, the lawyer, uh, has told me that it ain't so. So I'm wondering to what extent you, as an early modern legal historian, uh, might want to to sort of extract yourself from the entire discussion you've presented and and talk about I don't know some other level at which law exists. First, a story: um, the in early Pennsylvania, the Quakers were in charge for first couple of decades. Uh, juries were selected. Um, in uh, one of the counties, I forget which, by a little child putting his hand into a bowl with all the names of the adult men and picking out jurors randomly. He was, the kid was blindfolded. And if you look at the couple of decades when the Quakers were in charge, almost all the jurors were Quakers. At a certain point in the early 18th century, the government change turned over. Quakers lost control. The little boy now started picking out non-Quaker jurors almost exclusively until such time as the government turned back, and now the little boy was speaking Quakers again. So I'm completely prepared to believe in the early modern world uh, that the practice of law may not fit with uh, the law in the books. Um, but let me start with your first point about um, uh, the relationship between local religious minorities and local groups and centralization. Um, I absolutely agree with you. There's a wide variety of relationships it used to be that the state building literature a couple of generations ago focused on the penetration of the central state, penetration in terms of extending its rule over greater quantum of territory, extending its rule downward into lower strata of society and through office holding bureaucracies and so forth. But the newer moves in the last couple of decades is to think about it much more interactively of how local groups are sometimes begging the central state to come in and help them uh, because they see that the central state can further their own objectives. So it's a much more interactive and culturally based process. And in no sense do I want 
to, to deny that. Um, I focused on one little corner of all of this, the ability of, the desire of religious groups in some instances to keep their believers in disputes in the fold and stop them from going outside. That doesn't, I don't mean to imply that's the only relationship that the community would have with outside authority. Okay? But just in this one little corner, which you hear about a lot where I live in early America, in early modern England, there may be parallels to the Jewish case. Okay, I, I will try to succeed. Uh, uh, to be a people on that. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, no, it, it's, it's just a kind of a technical issue that uh, with uh, this community, with uh, Effectively, you have a very traditional written base, so that uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, uh, you have uh, the commentary, the gloss, and the further commentary which we associate with this community is actually being done by uh, Jewish women scholars, and Rashi's law stater, or the Talmud's commentator, actually much ahead of time, uh, because the written text is, uh, that is, ahead of the Christian scholars. On the other hand, that's just uncommon. On the other hand, when you're talking about uh, dissemination and you're talking about prohibition of going uh, outside Jewish, Jewish law, the Jewish authorities saying, well, don't go to the state courts, and then the state courts, of course, try to prohibit it, the question is, what is the state court? Because uh, it, certainly in Rome, in early modern Rome, it was a total balagan. And the Jews could be, uh, could be caught between different authorities who were competing with each other. And then I have a case of one poor Jew who was caught between the, the, the conservatore and the gubernatore and, and uh, the vice vigente and, and all these things. And he wound up getting, getting uh, pulled apart on the, on, the, on the table, the torture table. So that uh, these things seem to me to have, have you know, a much, a very difficult process of, of elaboration. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, in, the, uh, um, in the context of, say, Puritans and early Quakers, they are also similarly caught in these horrifying jurisdictional binds, uh, not knowing who actually on the books has jurisdictions. Multiple authorities would claim it. They would have a religious impulse sometimes to keep their people out of the court systems, unless they could practically and pragmatically benefit from introduction, and then they're caught in these terrible dilemmas. You know, again, I, I take the point. Yeah.